to History 103. In this lecture, I am going to discuss uh, the idea of race and the development of what we call today the United States, looking at it from different angles. I want to begin by looking, um, sorry, by addressing this idea of, um, I don't want to give her too much prominence, so I won't say her name, but she's one of these provocateurs and both social media and popular culture, po political culture. And one thing that, that she noted was that when it comes to slavery, was that um, slavery was not invented by Europeans. It's such a ridiculous argument that she makes. But um, uh, the problem with her point of view is that she assumes that slavery is all equal. It's all the same throughout history. And for whatever reason, she believes that <clears throat> people that that are in academia believe that you know slavery started in the 1500s with the slave trade. Um, and then she goes into this whole thing about uh, you know Africans had slavery and, and blah blah blah, right? So part of it is to kind of challenge such kind of nonsense. So this lecture digs deeper, um, provides better analysis of ideas of slavery and racism. Um, and another thing that another point that this provocateur does is that she says that you know it's it's you know, what we do is a whole business and and just so you know there's no money in what we do I I published and the only money I ever got um, actually I never got any money <laughs> I just get uh, free copies of books um, of you know of the book that I publish or the article that I publish within a book so I'll, I'll get like two free copies and um, I think that's the problem is that there's a sense that um, we do this to incite people and to um, create some kind of revenue. And, you know, what we do is academic research. We are interested in seeking truth, but um, we know that our ideas will always be challenged by other academics, not by, again, social media darlings who, who really know nothing about what uh, academics is all about. So th this lecture would take her argument and definitely challenge it to show you that slavery has differed in different eras and in different places at the same time. So particularly the 14th, 15th century. So um, we're going to, to look, at, look at these topics. So we begin by, uh, well, here's the title of the <clears throat> lecture. It's called Colonization, Mestizaje, and Chattel Slavery. And there's a few, obviously all these words are very important because we will look at colonization. There's no way around when addressing the development of the Americas without looking at colonization. Um, for the most part, this is a fact, right? And then we're going to kind of challenge this notion of pure colonization because it's really a mestizaje. Uh, a lot of times people like to use kind of melting pot theory, and I don't think that's very useful. Um, it hasn't been useful since maybe the 1980s. So we're going to take take it to a different level and, and probably use this concept um, uh, as a better example of what happens in the Americas, where melting pot makes it sound like it's all equal. And here we're going to show that, no, there's, there is mixing, but there's a power relation happening at different times. So this isn't just about Europeans conquering other people and, you know, these other people are oppressed and the Europeans are on top. Mestizaje is, it's a muddier, more complicated concept when it comes to to this idea of colonization. And then we will end by looking at the concept of chattel slavery. And this is really what differs from other systems of slavery. So yes, slavery has always existed, but nothing like this, okay? So by looking at chattel slavery, we look at this notion of the construction of the other, which will really focus on the notion of race formation. So again, we're, we're looking at it from a very academic lens, not through kind of some YouTube video or TikTok video or some kind of social media generic perspective on these subjects. So um, everything that I use is based off, you know, um, either prof uh, professors I studied under or, or just academic articles, uh, books that I've read. Uh, so it's all 
grounded on academic studies. <clears throat> so I don't want you to think that this is my, my opinion by any means, okay? So we have a few key objectives that I want you to, um, that you should be able to understand by the end of this lecture. So number one, we will, uh, at least I will explain uh, the movement into this idea of what becomes America. So we'll be looking at it through different lenses. Uh, typically we get a, a Europe West kind of perspective. And here we're going to definitely talk about Europe, but we're going to look at it from a different lens. We're going to look at European uh, mestizo and African movement, you know, uh, south, um, from the south to the north, right? And, and movement, um, obviously, from Europe to the west. Um, and then movement into Africa and movement into uh, where we live today, in Arizona, right? Into the northern part of of New Spain at this time. So this should give you a much more complicated lens as to how America became a nation because the book does this too, right? It covers Mesoamerica um, and obviously covers different parts of the creation of the, uh, of the colonies. So we're going to kind of explore these different lenses. Number two, we're going to address the conquest of these different civilizations and again, we're, we're going to create a very complex picture of what happens to them. Nothing is absolute. Uh, because this is a general class, we have to give you kind of a general view of what happens. And understand that people can, um, or students can take classes in each of, the, each of these subjects and dig deeper into this material, which makes it even much more complex, right? So you're just getting the tip of the iceberg, if you will. <clears throat> Number three, we're going to analyze the impact of mestizaje. So if you can see back here in this um, background picture, when it comes to the concept of race, uh, most of us understand it maybe through our own I guess senses, right, of what we have experienced and what we know. But when you look at it from an academic perspective, it gets much more complicated. And, and we're going to dig into this idea, at least I am, right? And when it comes to race, we see different uh, geographical areas have different systems of race. In America, we have a very, uh, we've always had very kind of like one drop theory type of system. Uh, you know, you're white or you're black, and if you had one drop of black blood in you, you were considered black, which, you know, makes no sense. But, um, you know, that's, you know, the kind of American idea of race. But when you look at Mesoamerica, and remember that these people migrated north, um, even before, you know, people reached the American colonies, um, we see a different system. And you see part of that in these pictures with all these different categories that they had. You can see over here, it's already at number 12. And I can't remember how many there were, but as more people mix, they had to create a new category and more people mix after that and you create another one to the point that it almost became ridiculous and almost too, I don't say too complicated, but uh, the belief was that the system could not go forever. So it ended up collapsing um, uh, onto itself. But again, we'll talk about this system of castas as they were known and lastly we're going to discuss a system of racial categories and racial constructions in north um, in the north american continent so i don't want to present this idea like you know there were no problems when it came to um uh, before they had kind of legal um laws in in, in different places because People of color were seen as lower than other people. Um, so we're going to look at how did that process come about? How did we go from having no concept of race in the world to the 15th century all of a sudden having these different racial categories? And this is, uh, this is somewhat of a sociological argument, uh, you know, sociological studies, to address how race was constructed. And, and I want you to understand that um, this concept of race does not exist, but it does exist. And it's kind of hard to wrap around your head because we're, we're so accustomed 
to the way we have always been uh, taught about race. But uh, I'm going to present to you from uh, scholars from my alma mater that address the construction of race. So we begin by looking at this notion as to what are the origins of the United States? Many of us uh, have been presented one narrative, so we are so familiar with it that if somebody takes us into a different avenue, it makes us feel very uncomfortable. Uh, you see here the pictures, right, uh, where you have uh, the pilgrims coming over to the, you know, um, the Atlantic uh, coast of, of the colonies. And what the reading does, even with, you know, what the chapter does, is actually present you with different lenses. One of them is definitely the people that are already here uh, having an impact on the people who are arriving. But then you also have you know, these different versions of where does America begin? And it talks about people in Mesoamerica, right? And, and what was called New Spain moving north into the, the Southwest. So the most common perspective that we, uh, that we typically receive is this kind of Northern European migration. Uh, and this presents it in a very kind of British lens. And when we use this model, we tend to obtain a very linear perspective where the British uh, political, the British cultural, and the British religious institutions and traditions often guide our view of other communities, uh, such as those of other Europeans, those of African, and those of native civiliz civilizations. Uh, often, these institutions that were here before are just being replaced by English institutions and English civilization. As academics, we have to understand that that is never the case. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have more this idea of mestizaje where there's more mixing. But again, this creates a much more complex picture, which we're not comfortable with. Uh, by using this kind of Northern European migration model, it presents the British immigrants as one historian noted, to be defined as almost uh, invisible immigrants, as though their status never seems to be questioned, and they exist as though they've always been here. Again, this makes us so um, one-dimensional by having uh, by looking through this lens, because we assume Europeans have or British have always been here, right? Because they just kind of take over all these other communities, and we find that that's never. Uh, the case. <clears throat> in reality, what we find is that many of these British migrants who came to the Americas didn't really have a close tie to the British crown. Many of them had a closer tie to their uh, religion or to their regional identity rather than to this concept called Britain or England or whatever it may be. So again, um, we're going to challenge this model that has often been used and more than likely you have been taught from probably kindergarten to until high school. And uh, you might feel a little bit uncomfortable and that's fine, you know, but um, I don't want to say have an open mind because it's, I'm, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. The real, reality is, is that these uh, other models are just as important as the British model. So another common um, model that we tend to be familiar with is the, the continental European migration, where people are leaving a bad situation. Uh, so they're escaping uh, bad experiences over there in Europe um, or that they're you know, coming to the, to the Americas seeking wealth. Uh, <clears throat> this kind of presents it as though, uh, again, they're the main actors and they're the ones who are kind of dominating these different communities. Uh, rather, we have to look at this migration from the continental, um, uh, continental Europe more as a very complex system that is tied to global commerce. Recent scholarship has challenged such a viewpoint, um, as you will see in the next chapter, <clears throat> but we must note the influence that these continental Europeans had on the Americas. Understand that we had Europeans here, right? We had the Dutch here. 
right? We had all these different people here besides the British. And I will briefly talk about the Dutch when I talk about uh, slavery and, um, and places like New York. Another important model, and, and this is something that um, I'm well versed in because you know I, I, I deal with these type of topics in, in my research, is really this kind of Spanish migration model. Uh, this uh, kind of really challenges this notion of where did the United States begin? So most of us are familiar with maybe the early 1600s with, you know, again, the Pilgrim story. However, when we look at Spain, we get a different story because they were here uh, almost 100 years before the British. So even though most people connected to, to the kind of East Coast um, at Atlantic region, we were um, actually going to look and present this idea of Spanish settlements in what is today the Americas. Uh, because understand that it's not like the United States was uh, invented in 1619, right? <laughs> it didn't exist. It would take another, what, 200 years or something um, to create it. So by looking at the Spanish migration, we find that their influence probably has a bigger impact on our daily lives than, say, some you know British uh, colonists in the East Coast. And I say this because these Spanish um, people migrated to places such as Florida, um, to Louisiana, right? They actually control some of this territory. And even all the way into Kansas, along with places like Arizona, California, Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and even into Oregon, right? So we probably have more in common with this story than we do with uh, the other one because look at our culture here particularly arizona culture with the cowboy culture i mean that emerges from this migration look at the, at the food that we eat i, I recently uh, saw an article that ge your generation you those of you that are in your 20s um mexican food uh tends to be the top food of this generation more than italian food which always tended to dominate and uh, for us probably rings true because of our connection to this kind of this region that we live in and then um, other ways that we see it is in our architecture right? all this kind of spanish style definitely the mission systems and our language the name of you know the mountains that are here um you know streets and and you know so forth and so on right there's just so much that we are connected to due to the spanish migration from south to north not from east to west Another important group, and this is, a, a, again, another lens, is African peoples. If the U.S. was built on capitalism and commerce, then we must address how African and African Americans were the engine of that economy. So they came, not by choice, right? They were not coming to the Americas to seek gold or anything like that, but they came as part of the colonization process and without them, this idea of the United States would not exist. We're not saying that, um, you know, they were the only ones um, in, in helping establish the United States, but definitely they play a very important role um, in different ways. And again, we'll, we'll talk about this as we move forward. So their stories are very significant to the development of, of the United States, the, particularly looking at the institution of slavery and and how they were impacted by this institution. So these are subjects that, uh, again, we can spend a lot of time on and we do offer courses on African American history and, and you're welcome to take those classes if, if you wish to, to learn more. And it's an important lens, right? We, we cannot deny it. <clears throat> Another significant group are our native populations. Uh, the book does a good job you know, this is something that came about only since maybe the 1990s, where these different voices, voices are being heard. Uh, a lot of it has to do because of new research that has emerged in the last 20, 30 years. So we need to recognize the impact that Native American civilizations had on the Americas. 
each bringing their own culture, their own traditions, and their own identity, and shaping not just their own culture, but also American culture. We find that many of these Europeans that arrived to the Americas actually assimilated into native culture. As I said, that Northern European migration model is the most dominant one, but what we find in reality is that as, particularly in the early period, when these migrants migrated here, they were dependent on native culture. They took elements of these cultures. Uh, just to give you an example, there is this uh, Spanish explorer who, who ended up in Texas and, and got shipwrecked there. His name is uh, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca. And, uh, you know, he landed there and with a few people. And he survived only by the grace of native communities. Uh, historian Manuel Gonzalez noted that in 1536, the Montley group, you know, the, the Vaca's group, uh, more Indian than white was eventually rescued. And the key word there is that he was, they were more Indian than white, quote unquote, right? Saying that they had assimilated into native culture in order to survive. So we have to um, talk about Native Americans. And, and in this story, um, I'm not going to talk about him too much. And right here, I'm talking about him. But, um, you know, the book does devote a, a good chunk of time um, to Native communities and the impact that they had in the Southwest. And uh, again, scholarship is, is kind of heading this way because new research is emerging about their stories and the way, again, that Europeans were impacted by Native culture just as much as the other way around. Oops, sorry. Um, before I move forward, I want to address that, you know, there's other communities that unfortunately I just don't have the luxury to talk about that I, I might leave out. Um, but those are important stories. So, you know, I won't be talking about women, which is a very key group uh, in development of the, of the Americas uh, through different ways. I mean, just the development of the United States, uh, sorry, the, the American, what become the American colonies. They were very instrumental in developing communities uh, in, in, in helping um, some of these European men obtain land, right? So I do teach women's history um, in case you're interested. So we, we do kind of dabble a little bit on that. You know, um, I could teach, we could look at LGBT communities. There they were actually LGBTQ communities at this time. So, uh, but uh, again, for, because I can only talk about so much, I won't be talking about them. And um, even Asian communities, uh, they played a very important role uh, in, in some of these stories. And uh, I'm just not well versed in those stories, so I don't want to um, um, disrepresent them and, and misrepresent them in a negative way. Um, in a way that I'm not just just not capable of. As I noted at the beginning, this is not just a story of a melting pot. That model has been outdated since probably the 1970s, though I think it's still being taught. There's a great book called Lies My Teacher Told Me, in case you're, you enjoy reading, and definitely does a great job challenging everything you've been taught from K to 12. But that melting pot theory is very um, problematic because it presents everybody as equal, right? Everybody adds something to this idea that's called America. So that's part of the reason why we're not using it because that story is much more complex. Where power dynamics, intercultural connection, and struggles is really the story that we should be telling, uh, which is why I use this concept of mestizaje, right? Mestizaje is not a melting pot. Mesti mestizaje presents this notion of give and take, domination over one group, but also showing that that group is not completely dominated, showing how some of these people that were dominated try to take positions of power right and the reason why i like using this is because it really kind of utilizes michel foucault's theory of power where it constructs reality not because it's real but rather 
due to hegemony. So if you ever heard of Michel Foucault or if you've taken philosophy and study postmodern theory, the story is never simple. And that's what Michel Foucault more or less kind of does. And, and I'm not going to dig too much into uh, postmodernism because you know, that's a whole class onto itself. But I, I do want to use this, this kind of theory of hegemony because we have to understand that it's not a simple story of white people were the problem or they were all at fault we find that the story is much more complicated. And a good example is with what happens in Mesoamerica, right? So definitely there is a system of power, which is what Michel Foucault uh, kind of notes, but it's not just one group versus another. That concept of hegemony is very significant. Hegemony basically relates to this notion that, um, to put it simply, those in power create reality, right? Those in power write, um, write the laws. And then those that have, that lack power, doesn't have to be about race, it could be class too. Um, they have to follow these, these rules, right? They fall under this hegemony. And it gets to the point that it becomes a sort of common sense that we learn through hegemony these notions of quote-unquote common sense, even though they are not, all right? So... Um, you'll see this develop as we move forward because, uh, you know, a good example is, you know, how did African people accept that they were slaves when they outnumbered many of the masters and many of the population that was not, that were not slaves? You know, how was it that they, some of them um, accepted this condition, right? And that's where hegemony comes into play, right? Well, there are these different institutions that are established to make them into second-class citizens, and there's power utilized to make sure that they don't um, challenge that system. Obviously, you do have uprisings, but um, again, that's what hegemony does. It, it becomes a common sense where you kind of accept that, that condition. All right, so we'll be using that theoretical model. Again, you know, Michel Foucault's you know, theory of power, but also what we call Mestizaje. So before I get into the historical aspect, I want to address some key concepts. <clears throat> One of them is uh, kind of like where I started at the beginning, uh, kind of challenging this this person's idea of, you know, some of the definitions that that she presents as, you know, everybody, slavery has always existed. All right, so. Let me begin by touching on the idea of race. So as I mentioned earlier, the concept of race is relatively new, emerging around the 15th century. Don't ask me for an exact date because there is no exact date. It's a process. And I want you to understand the events of our past continue to shape the present. So race it's much more than just the color of your skin, though definitely that plays a significant role. Um, race is one of these concepts where it exists, but it doesn't exist, all right? So there's a lot of times people say, well, race is just an illusion. And if we stop talking about it, then it will just go away. Uh, unfortunately, these type of uh, systems do not operate in that way. Right. And, and I mean, th again, this is like a whole class, but uh, we're just I'm going to try to keep it somewhat simple. Right. So those who assume that a non-racist social order would eliminate it are wrong. Now, we're working towards that, but we have to understand that race plays a role in our everyday life. The first thing we notice on a person is the color of their skin. And because we've been taught so much about these racial categories through, again, racist kind of concepts, ideas pop up into our head as to what the color of their skin means. So race is very unstable. It can change at different times. It's decentered. It's a decentered complex of social meanings constantly being transformed by political struggle. What does this mean? Well, basically what it is saying is that race um, 
Again, it doesn't exist, but it exists because we have constructed it. And it can change its meaning at any given time. Just to give you a quick example, in the 1920s, Mexican uh, Americans were defined as white. In the 1930s, uh, we all of a sudden became non-white. And then in the 1940s, we became white again. <laughs> so, you know, what happened? Did we get lighter in skin tone? No. The Great Depression happened, right, in the 1930s, where all of a sudden we became, or Mexican Americans became undesirable. And they were, you know, repatriated back to, to Mexico. So their racial category um, was shifting depending on the political climate. So uh, racial categories are always very unstable uh, depending on you know, the political climate. So we often use a biological basis in understanding race. However, we have to understand that that biological um, basis is rooted in a social and historical process. In other words, power is the key element here. In developing race, then, we develop concepts of racial formation. Now, racial formation is the social historical process by which racial categories are created, inhabited, transformed, and destroyed. Racial formation is a process of historically situated projects where human bodies and social structures, i.e. institutions, are represented and organized. Racial formation then is linked to the idea of hegemony the way in which society is organized and rule, ruled. So what is racial formation? <laughs> I gave you a very academic definition. So basically, historical events in the past have shaped the way we have viewed racial categories, which are often constructed through hegemony, through those in power. Again, I'm not saying those, you know, white people or anything like that, right? What I'm saying is that certain institutions are constructed to define these concepts of race. Now, certainly certain people benefit from it at the expense of other human bodies. Okay, and again, we'll look at this institution of slavery to see um, how skin tone, uh, slavery, and laws come together. So when it comes to the concept of slavery, as I noted in the introduction with that provocateur who looks at slavery like, well, you know, white people did not invite, invent it or Europeans did not invent it. She looks at it so simplistically that you almost have to laugh of, of, of the way she observes and defines slavery. So um, again, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper and give you a much more complex understanding of the concept of slavery. So the idea of slavery I guess she's correct in this assumption that slavery is nothing new. <laughs> and that's about all she is correct in. Um, so everybody kind of knows this already, right? <laughs> Every civilization has implemented a system of slavery at some point. In Europe, as you can kind of see over here in this picture, um, they implemented a system called serfdom. It wasn't quite slavery. Um, also, I mean, they weren't free, and, but there you do have a system of power, right? Where certain uh, Europeans had limited, um, a limited voice. So this system of serfdom, where people were tied to the land, uh, we have to kind of address that. Yes, you know, it can, they were kind of forced to work the land of a lord, but they did have certain legal status depending on place too. This is a system that emerges in the Middle Ages about a thousand years ago. Uh, again, very generically, you can take my History 101 and we'll talk more about serfs. Um, you know, they provided a, a, labor, um, a labor service to their Lord. They had to pay rent and they were subject to the Lord's jurisdiction. Often, uh, they could not have their um, their own land without the Lord's permission. They could only marry within the manor, within the territory of the Lord, unless they got, they got approval from their Lord. 
so they can marry outside of their, those courts. So did Europeans have a slave system? In the Middle Ages, they, it, it more or less slavery, slavery goes away. They had this institution called serfdom. But you know, you could go back to the Romans and Greeks and so forth. Yes, they had slave systems. And you could look at after the 14th, uh, 15th century, slavery is reintroduced within Europe um, in, the, in, in that time. Another group that we have are uh, in, in Africa before, now this is important, before uh, European arrival. Did they have slaves? Again, going back to the provocateur, yes, they did, right? However, and this is key, it differed dramatically from what is instituted in the uh, 16th century. And that is important to note. Slavery in pre-European Africa was a temporary state of legal exclusion. However, slaves had the same spiritual value as a free person. That would change once Europeans come and, and begin to dominate this region. Uh, slaves in, in pre-European Africa were allowed to marry, have a family, have independent income, and could purchase their freedom. This is what makes it so different. And again, this is why that person is so wrong in so many levels. In Mesoamerica, here you have a picture, right, of, uh, of uh, Mesoamerica. Did they have slavery there? Of course they did. As I noted earlier, every civilization has, has had a form of slavery. So in Mesoamerica, slavery was common, but nothing like, uh, like in Europe, uh, like what the Europeans institute, where it's her hereditary. It was essentially a contract of selling your labor for an agreed period, period of time in return for physical maintenance. So basically, more than likely you had a debt or you couldn't afford to, to survive. So you sold your, your freedom to somebody, but they had to take care of you, right? Uh, there are various reasons why people went into slavery in Mesoamerica. But it was always a temporary status. And that's the key word, both for Africa and for Mesoamerica. And I'm sure for other parts of the world, too. Um, did they enslave during wars? Yes, all these uh, civilizations would enslave other people during time of war. In Mesoamerica, they, were, you know, they would enslave people and capture them and maybe sacrifice them, right? Um, it just depended. In, in Europe, uh, by the 15th century, we saw slavery grow in numbers, uh, in great numbers by the latter part of the Middle Ages. So again, 14th, 15th century. Uh, and in the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain, uh, region, Muslims and Christian Orthodox, uh, Christian Orthodox are those um, Christians that come from, say, Greece area, and maybe the Slavic region. They comprise the largest numbers of slaves in Spain. In Italy, slaves served as, served as domestics and even as urban workers, but they could obtain their freedom um, if they can purchase it. Some of them were from the African continent, but they were also from different parts of Europe, particularly because Italy is so close to um, Eastern Europe, such as you know, what is today Yugoslavia and, and you know, the, that region. So they would enslave a lot of people from there. I understand that the word slave comes from the word Slav. Right. In Africa, did African people enslave their own people? Now, this is a, a again, this is a, a complicated picture, uh, a complicated answer, because people in Africa did not see themselves as African people, as one people, the way we see ourselves as Americans, or as um, maybe as the way. <clears throat> You know, people were, saw, themselves, saw themselves as part of a, of a community. Africa is a big continent with many different tribes there. So did they enslave them, um, you know, their own people? Uh, it's more of a no than a yes. So just like Europeans enslave other Europeans and, other, you know, Mesoamericans enslave other Mesoamericans. In Africa, uh, a historian has argued that there wasn't anything like chattel slavery and that's the key difference 
uh, anthropologist Jan Van Sina noted that in uh, West Central Africa, there was no word for slave. The closest word that we had for a slave in the, in the African continent before the Europeans arrived was the word pika, which meant a servant. Again, a temporary status. However, once the slave trade kicked in, the word pika will begin to take, in, take on a, a new meaning. Within the African continent, most slaves were women who were often purchased as wives, concubines, household servants, and agricultural laborers. I think even the book noted the important role that women played in the African continent before the Europeans uh, came there. And the reason why you know, they were enslaved women, because they could be more easily assimilated into the local kinship group. Right? They could be assimilated into the local community uh, because they did most of the agricultural work. The value of women in Africa was high as the husband's family would give a bride's wealth to the bride's family. Again, in Europe, you don't have anything like this. In Europe, typically, it's the bride's father who has to give the husband something in order to take his daughter, Right? That's what we call a dowry. Um, and the reason why in Africa they, they did the bride's wealth is because the family was losing a contributor to, to the household. So that's, that's why her husband needed to give the wife's family something in return for that. So women's labor was highly valued in addition to their reproductive ability, right? Because women are able to have kids. So they would move into this new household and actually contribute much more than um, um, than you know the way again Europe sees women as you know as, as kind of almost dependents right as children uh, in Africa it was quite different women not that they were completely independent but definitely contributed more than say Europe a European woman at the time <clears throat> So part of it too had to relate because women um, were part of a communal group, right, in, in, in the African continent. <clears throat> so yes, African did enslave other African people. Um, they also enslaved men. Uh, you know, again, during the time of military, they would enslave them. Um, but they also played important administrative roles, uh, also um, labor roles. So by the time the Europeans come to the African continent, there is a slave system at play, but nothing like what the Europeans actually do. And again, that's the aspect of hegemony, right? And power, how they change something that's already there into something different. So what Europeans did was basically exploit a system that was there. They commercialized it to a system of selling other human beings. Another key concept that, that is important to this whole story is religion. As a reading noted, Europe was caught in religious conflicts um, in the 15th, 16th century, where you have Catholics fighting Protestants. But these conflicts were more than just about religion themselves, uh, about religious religion itself. Um, yes, so there, there was dogma fights, uh, but they were also political, but they were also connected to the global um, kind of global uh, colonization process that was taking place at the same time period in the 15th century. So religion will play an important role in the colonization process. It was one where people were forced to convert. You were forced to choose sides, particularly for the people that were being conquered in places like Mesoamerica or in Africa, where you were forced to become Catholics um, without having a choice. <clears throat> 
and it was a, a, a forced conversion that people have to pay with blood. We have people such as Los Reyes Católicos, people such as Fernand and Queen Isabella, who sought to convert native people and threaten anybody who put them into slavery. However, we have to know that they actually had um, Native Americans who were slaves in their courts. So often, Europeans would actually use religion to justify slavery enslaving those that were non-Christian. So there's, you know, they use a lot of biblical passages and stories to help justify the institution of slavery. And then lastly, much of the gold and silver that were extracted from the Americas was used to fight the religious wars of Europe, of King Charles of Spain. He used what was called the Juro, uh, J-U-R-O, which is basically a government bond that paid interest. And it was backed up with future gold and silver that was coming from the new world in order to protect the Catholic faith. There was so much gold and silver coming from the Americas that you know, King Charles, along with other people, uh, used this money or you know, this, um, you know, this gold and, and silver to pay for wars. And actually, the biggest benefactors of the you know the extraction of, of these metals from from the Americas were not Europeans, right? It wasn't your laborer, it wasn't your your tradesmen. It was actually bankers, particularly in the Dutch region, because they were the one lending the king money, because he said, "I promise I will give you know I'll pay back this loan with what's coming." So they were, you know, uh, the Dutch were were happy to loan him money because they knew they were going to get it back. And just to give you an example of how much gold came out of, or sorry, how much silver came out of uh, a place like, say, Bolivia, there was this mountain where they extracted so much silver that it is said that you could build a bridge from Bolivia all the way to Seville of pure silver. It just shows you how much silver came out of this one mountain and that you could build a bridge back with the bodies that it took to extract this. So much death happening to take this silver. So religion, by no means, are they immune to this whole system of what happens. So let's look at the history of how this idea of race, chattel slavery, mestizaje come about. We begin by looking at La Reconquista. <clears throat> in Spain, the book briefly talks about this. Um, in Spain, you have the Moors. Uh, these were Muslims who controlled Spain for many years. And uh, around 700 years. And it's a complicated story. Again, this, this deserves its own history. It, it's it's kind of long. Um, but to simplify it, basically the Moors control Spain. And if you were alive in medieval Europe, let's say about a thousand years ago, you did not want to live in England. You did not want to live in Germany or in France. Uh, you wanted to live in Spain. Spain was the place to be. And it was because of the Moors. Um, the story goes that the, um, these Aryan um, Catholics in Spain... Uh, were fighting other Aryan Catholics, or sorry, not Aryan Catholics, uh, Aryan Christians were fighting another Aryan Christian group. And that one of the kings um, went down south to the, you know, the north of Africa and asked these Muslims to come help them. And the Muslims said, yeah, that's, you know, we'll, we'll help you. And they ended up taking over, right? So um, in 711, they come over and, and they basically control all the Iberian Peninsula, you know, Portugal and Spain. <clears throat> But Spain under Muslim control was a great place. They had things like, like um, um, oranges. I, I believe oranges. Uh, they had bananas. They had sugar. Um, it was a place of knowledge. It was a place that was, you know, it wasn't perfect by any means, but they accepted difference. 
you know, today we, you know, we see conflicts between maybe, say, Muslims and, and Jewish people. Not here. Um, it was noted that the caliphate in the Middle East was so kind of irate with a caliphate in the Iberian Peninsula because they were so open to different people. Um, they, they traveled, they were able to navigate because of their knowledge. Um, they had uh, running, you know, kind of, I don't want to say running water, but they had these great places where, where you have fountains and some of the greatest architecture. So if you've ever been to Southern Spain or if, if you ever think of going to Southern Spain, um, much of that architecture is because of the Moors, the Muslims. However, around the 10th century, really 11th century, we begin to see Spain um, <clears throat> be dominated by Christians. Now, this La Reconquista, it's, it's, it's a very problematic word because it presents it like a reconquest, right? That the Spanish Christians were reconquering what was once theirs. So understand that this is very problematic because nobody technically owned, particularly these Christians who were trying to reconquer this territory, didn't technically own this territory. I mean, again, these were Catholic Christians. Uh, what I noted at the beginning was that it was Aryan Christians who were, you know, in, in, in northern Spain. So... But, you know, this, this story of La Reconquista has taken life onto its own. And just to kind of simplify it, <clears throat> the Catholic Christians are essentially blessed by the Pope to take over this territory for, Christ, uh, for the Catholic faith. All right. This is actually where you see the beginnings of the crusade ideas before the actual crusades in the Middle East. Uh, I think the Pope, the Pope gives the blessing, you know, to go and, and kill um, um, non-Christians and, you know, your, your sins will be, um, what's the word, um, forgiven, basically, if, if you're to die in, 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 under this cause. So you had this kind of chivalry crusading ethos emerge in Spain. And eventually that kind of takes off to the, to the Middle East. By the 14th century, you have the marriage of Fernand of Aragon with Isabel of Castile, who uh, allowed these two kingdoms to come together to reach one goal, which is really to the establishment of one of Europe's largest army and institute one faith, the Catholic faith. And in 1492, they would be successful in pushing out the Moors, the Muslims. Before them, um, you know, before 1492, however, as I noted earlier, uh, Spain was probably one of the best places to be alive in the Middle Ages. We find that Muslims allowed different groups to practice their faith, which allowed the flourishing of one of Europe's most unique cultures. This was called the Covivencia, C-O-V-I-V-E-N-C-I-A, where Muslims... Jewish people and Christians coexisted together. Again, not always perfect, but for the most part, um, you know, the, the Muslims allowed them to practice their faith. They just had to pay a higher tax. So if you converted, actually, it would benefit you. And we do have some Christians that converted into Islam. <clears throat> uh, the Spanish Europeans would push for the opposite. They would pu push for a single homogenous community based on the fiction that Spain had once been entirely Christian and should be restored to its formal purity. So what happens to those people who practice this different faith? If the Muslims allowed you to practice your faith, uh, only you, know, you had to pay a, a tax. What happened with uh, once the Spanish began to take over. Well, the most kind of interesting story is what happens to Jewish people. Um, so even before 1492, as the Spanish are regaining some of this territory, <clears throat> we find that Jewish people were forced out of Spain. It is noted that about somewhere between 100,000 to 200,000 Jewish people 
uh, lost their territory, their homes, and were pushed out of the kingdom. Some of them migrating to different parts of Europe, other to Jerusalem. Um, you know, they just needed to leave. Those who stayed were forced to convert, and some of them became what was what were called crypto Jews or conversos. <clears throat> Obviously, it's very hard to leave your faith, right? If I told you, if I force you to convert to Catholicism and you're some other faith, more than likely, you're not just going to give it up and say, okay, um, now I'm Catholic now, right? Uh, you're probably going to continue pra practicing your faith. So what we see, uh, even before 1492, in the 1460s, is that the Catholic Church gave the Spanish crown the right to set up an inquisition, which was a trial to seek out conversos, those who converted, uh, who showed signs of incomplete conversion. Um, there's a lot of kind of interesting stories where, um, you know, the crown basically is trying to root out those who did not convert. Many Jewish people in their home, they practice their faith but in, in, in the public space, they, they practice uh, Catholicism. Um, but this Inquisition was basically a winch, witch hunt. There's a, there's a funny story, not funny haha, -ha, but funny like, just interesting, in, where this Jewish woman was forced to, come, um, to go upon the Inquisition and they accuse her of, of not being one of these crypto Jews. And she tells them, um, I'm sorry, but I never converted, so uh, I cannot be tried in your court. And, um, you know, it pissed them off so much that they ended up killing her anyway. But, um, you know, it, it was just basically a witch hunt to get rid of people who they saw as undesirable. This Inquisition created this notion of the purity of blood laws where only Christians could have um, this pure Christian blood. Understand that faith is not something that runs in your blood, right? Faith is, is a belief system that can change at any given moment, right? However, we see how Christians are developing this notion of purity of blood. And by having this purity of blood, it gave them access to titles and land. Um, so those lands that were taken away were given to some of these Christians. Um, so again, it's a witch hunt in the sense that certain people have something to benefit if you can name names and, you know, get rid of people and you could take territory, households, income. And it is noted that the, um, the crown would take about 20% and then would sell the rest of it to, you know, these, these Catholics. Um, this would all lead to the discourse of what we kind of now understand as race, right? This would eventually add to this kind of language of Jewish, quote unquote, Jewish blood and Jewish race. We see how Jewish... Uh, people were no longer seen as people of a particular faith, but rather a people that somehow in their blood, they would never be able to convert into true Christians. So there's almost like no hope for them. And it becomes racialized. I mean, today, right, people, a lot of anti-Semitism, and I guess in the United States and in other parts of the world where they see Jewish people as a race. Um, we also see the, the, the Moors who stuck around. Um, you know, in 1492, they're finally kind of pushed uh, into Northern Africa. However, many of them stay. And they go through the same process. They go through this Inquisition also. There's convivencia. <clears throat> Sorry, I kind of skipped all these. Um, so that's what happens in Spain, right? In 1492, they begin to push out. So there's a, a time in Spain where there is relative tolerance. Once the Christian Catholics take over, there's no tolerance. 
you either convert or you go up against his Inquisition and they more than likely will kill you and take your, your stuff. Another important aspect that's happening here is gold. Gold was a major motivator to open up the African continent. So there had been a lot of trade happening in Europe, uh, particularly with places like, I don't want to say China, because it's not like Europeans were trading with China directly. There's all these kind of middlemen in the Middle East. <clears throat> but there's a lot of trade happening where they would trade a lot of times um, certain goods for other goods, right? Silk for wool or something like that. And, and Muslims were the ones who were part of these, you know, caravans bringing some of these goods to into Europe. Um, but also, they were also trading not only in the Middle East, but also in Africa. So we see uh, that trade had been going on for centuries in Africa with Muslim traders sending their caravans from the Niger River to the ports of Algier and Tunis. By the 1200s, Catalonia and Genoa had established trading colonies in Tunis, which is in northern Africa, ex exchanging northern European wool for grain and gold. By the 14th century, the appetite for gold has surpassed the demand as luxury goods skyrocketed and the exchange for goods was no longer applicable and only species became the ideal form of currency. In other words, People are no longer kind of bartering, bartering, right? Wool for silk or anything like that. But rather, these traders wanted gold, right? Pay, if you want, <clears throat> if you want to look at it this way, paying cash, right? Uh, you know, don't don't trade goods. By the fourteen, by the thirteen forties, uh, the silver mines of Poland and Bohemia could not keep up with the demand, and so there wasn't enough silver in circulation to keep up with the demand of. You know, all this trade that's happening. And they could not extract from the deep uh, uh, from the deep parts of the mines in this period. So even though there was more silver, the technology didn't exist to extract it in, in, in these regions. Thus, gold became an alternative currency, yet Europe lacked large quantities of gold reserves. So where were they going to get the, coal, the gold from? So places such as Mali and Ghana, which were known as the land of gold became highly sought after. So you see how, again, this kind of commerce is beginning to open up Africa because of the resources they have. And from there, we have to turn the story to Portugal. <clears throat> Before 1492, we need to discuss Portugal's role in Africa, who were seeking gold and slaves. <clears throat> in the 1440s, the Portuguese raided, uh, and excuse me for butchering some of these terminology, Mar uh, Mauritania, which is the northern western part of Africa, right below the Sahara Desert, and captured African people from the region. However, they encountered attacks, so by the 1460s, they basically stopped doing these raids of capturing African people, but rather relied on diplo diplomatic relations that involve trade agreements <clears throat> with the people that were there, the African people. So they developed these kind of military alliances where African tribes would fight other African tribes and would sell those people that they would capture to the Portuguese. So basically what the Portuguese de did was exploit, again, the system that's already there. As I noted earlier, slavery had already existed in Africa, but nothing like what is going to be introduced. So due to these pre-existing uh, trade routes within the African continent, it facilitated a new commercialization of slavery with the Portuguese. This became a race for the continent Therefore, militarizing uh, these tribes became a key component of the settlement building that happens in Africa. So the uh, Portuguese begin to build castles so they can use 
these locations within Africa to trade for gold and slaves. Therefore, protecting also their, their ter I guess, quote-unquote territories. As time goes on, they begin to develop colonies there. Uh, start with the Portuguese. Uh, and again, excuse me if I mispronounce the name, but in the island of Sao Tome, S-A-O-T-O-M-E, the Portuguese established sugar plantations. And they, were, they brought slaves from Benin and Congo to work the plantation. And this was set a system that would be transferred from the African continent into the Americas. And again, we're not saying that it's all Europeans, right? This is uh, these, these kind of um, people in, in commerce that are developing this. So some of these African slaves were shipped to Lisbon, which is in Portugal, where they were stripped of their clothing so they could be inspected by official evaluators and potential buyers with a price put around their neck. From Lisbon, Portugal, some were shipped to other parts of Europe, such as Valencia, who received over 200, or sorry, 2,000 slaves between 1489 to 1497. From there, some were shipped to the New World, and these slaves were known as Ladinos, L-A-D-I-N-O-S. Uh, and these were known as Latinized Africans, who became instrumental in the conquest and colonization of the Americas. So there's an earlier picture where you see, um, I think it's the conquest of Mexico, or maybe it's a little bit later, I can't remember. Uh, but you'll see a, a person in, um, they, they were darker, darker skin, right? And he was one of these Ladinos that came as part of that, that conquest. So again, this complicates the story even more, right? This concept of Mestizaje, where he becomes a, a colonizer. This African Ladino becomes a, a, a colonizer of Mesoamerica. So understand that racial systems are not fully ingrained yet in, 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 in the world. Um, so some of these African people could have uh, a higher status than what happens later. So we're kind of moving our way to the Americas now. So what happens in the Americas? Well, <clears throat> in 1492, we see Columbus right arrive to Mesoamerica, um, not Mesoamerica, but um, the Caribbean and, and you know places like Cuba and so forth. Uh, the Spanish established colonies there, and you have this um, uh, you know this kind of gateway to to Mesoamerica to what is today Mexico. Now understand that the Aztecs um, were they were a, a native Mesoamerican tribe that, for the most part, everybody hated in Mesoamerica. Uh, they had an empire. They conquered the majority of Mesoamerica from, say, Mexico City down south, um, and everybody was paying tribute. At least a good number of them were paying tribute to um, the Aztecs. And here you see Montezuma and the Aztecs. So when the Spanish arrived, um, there was already a Spanish guy here in, in the Americas who, um, they, they got shipwrecked. This is how they heard the stories of gold and so forth in Cuba. So Cortez set up this expedition and he's actually wanted by the crown because he left Cuba without permission. And um, he tells his men, you know, come with me and I promise you riches and, and um this basically meant that it was a do or die type of situation. <clears throat> but when he when he arrives in the Americas, he hears stories of you know these, this land of gold basically, and um, many of these people are just trying to get rid of him because they didn't know who he was. So Corte, um, Montezuma sent two scouts, and you know they got wind of this person coming from the east and, and going into um, obviously moving towards Tenochtitlan. Uh, but Cortes was able to exploit the alliances, uh, sorry, the, um, the uh, what do you call it, the, the conquest of the Aztecs, right? They were able, he was able to build alliances with those people who hated the Aztecs, such as the Tlaxcalans, 
When the Spanish arrive, uh, basically they would read this this piece called the Requerimiento, which was this, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what it said, but basically it was a speech saying, you are now conquered by the, by the crown of Spain, and you are now Catholics. So he would read these two people who had no idea what the heck he was talking about. Um, but it tells you, you know, they come with this mentality of taking land um, as though they already owned it, right? That's what the Requerimiento basically stated. So Cortez um, builds these alliances and he moves to, to the city called Tenochtitlan, which is a city where the Aztecs um, live. It's in Mexico City. It was like an island that they basically built on their own. And they, they welcome Cortez, um, particularly Montezuma. Uh, there's a story that says that they thought he was a god uh, I'm not sure how much weight you want to put on that because all these stories are written after the fact. But nevertheless, they welcome him. Um, and a funny story is that Cort Montezuma invites Cortez to one of the temples where they, you know, they house uh, uh, Hichipotli, the, the god of war. And what Cortez does is that he um, takes the god off and he puts the Virgin Mary and the cross uh, uh, onto its place. And at that moment, Montezuma's people wanted to kill Cortez, but Montezuma, Montezuma said no. And Cortez gets wind of this and he arrests uh, Montezuma. And from that point forward, relations really begin to break down and Tenochtitlan becomes a war zone. So up here you see a picture of the way the um, Cholulans were massacred by the Spanish, right? Here you see with the armor plates and just, it was just a massacre. Uh, the story was here in Cholula that uh, they were going to kill Cortez, the Cholulans were, but this woman, Doña Marina, or Malinche, as she is better known in Mexico, uh, heard the story and she told Cortez what was going to happen and Cortes in a preemptive attack killed um, not only the soldiers of Cholulan soldiers but also women and children. It was seen as an unprovoked attack. Now she becomes very important to the story. Um, it is noted that they had a relationship um, and they actually produced the first mestizo, right? Uh, La Malinche, as she's better known, she was uh, supposedly an Aztec uh, princess who was given to sold into slavery before Cortes arrived and when Cortes arrived to Veracruz she is given to Cortes or to his men her along with other 20 men and what she does is actually learn Spanish really quickly you know picks it up and I think she's like about 16 years old and um, she um, becomes not only his translator but also um, his lover and as I noted, they, they produce the first mestizo and they uh, eventually, um, after the conquest is all over, Cortez you know, drops her, gives her to another general and he takes the child to, um, to Spain with him. And uh, I think calls him Martin. Then he has another kid with somebody else and calls him Martin also. Kind of weird. But... Uh, uh, it, the story goes that if you ever heard the story of La Malinche, or sorry, the La Llorona, that it's actually tied to her because um, the story goes that she, you know, her son is taken away and for the rest of her life she feels sadness and wonders what happens to her son. She actually dies at a very young age, at the age of 26, I think, from uh, the European diseases. So... And that's a very kind of brief history of what happens in Meso, uh, Mesoamerica with the conquest of the Aztecs. Cortes um, wins this war. He, he fights a battle, basically, he fights in a way that European, uh, that Mesoamericans are not accustomed to. He basically uh, laid siege to Tenochtitlan, starves them out, uh, and then they, they, they face you know, smallpox and it just kills everybody. <clears throat> It is noted that about a third of the population dies of disease 
in Mesoamerica, which is a lot, right? 33%. So the aftermath, um, you know, some of them come for riches. When Cortes arrived to Tenochtitlan, he is in complete amazement of what he sees. He basically says, these people are more civilized than we are, if not equal, if uh, probably more. He is surprised of, you know, the great avenues that he sees. He is surprised by how clean the city is. You know, they pick up the trash on, on a weekly basis. There's these waterways that run through the city that makes it very perpendicular, unlike the cities in um, Europe that are, if you ever go to Europe, you get lost because they're, you know, they wind everywhere and they just make no sense. In, in, in Mesoamerica, in Tenochtitlan, they're in perfect, um, you know, um, 90 degree angles, right? Um, he is perplexed that there's so many people there. He says, how can they build a civilization without the true God? I mean, th these are his words, you know? And the city of Tenochtitlan had 250,000 people. The biggest city of Europe at this exact time only had 80,000 people, which was London at the time. So it just goes to show the the complete awe that Cortes is in when he arrives at Tenochtitlan. So besides gold and silver, you have the development of the Colombian exchange. Understand that when these Europeans traveled to the Americas, it wasn't to go explore, it wasn't to go find themselves, it was to go and bring back gold and silver. That's what they were seeking. However, that wasn't always possible, even though there was a lot of gold and silver, particularly when they land to they land on the islands. There isn't a lot of gold and silver there. So they must find other things to bring. So th this institutes the Colombian exchange, right? Where in Europe, there's a desire uh, for some of these Mesoamerican goods. I mean, think of the world without potatoes, right? No McAdees, right? Think of the world without tomatoes, no pizza, right? If you ever look at a medieval recipe book, European cuisine is disgusting. So it's these goods that are brought from the Americas into Europe that completely transform the diet of Europeans. And they get so used to it that it becomes almost European, right? Chocolate, tobacco, you know, the book gives you probably a list. So um, just as much as Europe impacted Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica impacted Europe. So, with the Europeans coming over, as I said earlier, they, they, they were not coming to explore. Typically the way it worked is that somebody would finance your, your trip here, right? And they would pay for the entire trip, but they expected, um, basically a dividend, right? Like like investing in a company today. They expected, which was called something called the, their quinto, particularly the crown. <clears throat> um, it's Q-U-I-N-T-O. They expected to get 20% of whatever they found. If it was, sold, if it, if it was gold or, or silver, great. There's a story where Cortez, um, he's... he's um, it's during the conquest, and you know they're they're trying to take as much gold as possible. There's a story where he's crossing, you know, they, they they're in Tenochtitlan, in like I said, it's an island in Mexico City at the time. It's 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 in a lake, and they um they're sneaking out, and and they have all this gold and silver, uh, you know, tied to their horses, and they are so heavy. That tells you how much they're taking, right? That the bridges begin to collapse, and they fall into the water. And many of them would rather die trying to keep that gold and to save themselves. Just shows you how hungry they were for gold. Another story where Cortez, you know, they're in middle battle and saying that he's writing these letters to the king and queen of Spain saying, um, you know, I'm sorry, I might not provide that much gold this, this time around because um, these people are looting a lot of your gold. And in my you know, my estimation is probably they were just keeping it, right? Because who's going to know? They're all the way in Mesoamerica. The king and queen of Spain are way over there, so they're not going to know anything. But the, again, the key point here is that the crown expected to get their quinto, whether it was in gold or in other ways. And the other way was through food, uh, you know, um, 
vegetables and, you know, again, sugar and stuff like that. It is noted that sugar um, basically destroys the, the diet of the English. Um, you know, there's so many health uh, concerns because prior to this period, sugar, um, the way they, they used to sweeten things was with honey, which isn't too bad for you. However, with this importation of cheap sugar, you know, almost anybody can consume it, can, can purchase it, right? So <clears throat> they um, obviously develop very bad eating habits and has major health risk, right? If you eat too much sugar, things like diabetes. So this Atlantic trade and, and this Colombian exchange has a major impact uh, many, many parts of the world, again, as I said, even Europe, they're impacted in a negative way too through their, through their health. So we see the importation. So we must understand that the movement um, was not a, a form of exploration, but rather as an economic exploitation. And there's really no other way to, to see this event. The Europeans were interested primarily in exploiting the natural resources and producing plantation crops such as sugar, coffee, cotton, uh, along with other goods, right? All old world tropical plants imported along with African slaves due to the diseases that wiped out the native populations. As I said, about a third of the population was wiped out. So even though Queen Isabella said, don't slay the native people, they, they, they were still enslaved. Um, but a third of them ended up dying. So let's look at the slave trade. So hopefully you're seeing how all these things are connected. And we're going to see how, how the, the concept of race is, de <clears throat> is developed through this system. So we're not saying that capitalism is directly to blame. Obviously, it's the people who are, who are exploiting this, these systems. And through this process, we see the development of, of race. And slavery. So make no mistake, the majority of European nations were involved in the slave trade. All right, a lot of times we just say, oh, it was Spain, Portugal, and the British, or whatever. No, it was Portugal, it was Spain, but you also had Denmark, you had Sweden, you had Norway, you had Prussia, right? You had the English. You had all these kingdoms that were bringing European goods, such as utensils made of brass, uh, pewter, they brought guns and gunpowder, alcohol, etc., right? All these goods from Europe uh, to Africa in exchange for slaves. In turn, ships such as the PAR, P A R R, have the capacity to carry about 700 slaves and about 100 crew members. Often, Europeans would reach a trading outpost in Africa and make contact with an African ruler or their representative to obtain captured people. As I noted earlier, again, that argument, well, African enslaved themselves, blah, 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 blah. As I already kind of um, addressed this, that at first it was Portuguese who were raiding uh, the, the, um, the continent, but it, it, it just became too expensive and they were able to exploit the, the, the slave system that's already there. So um, rather than, than go into the African continent, they just you know set up shop in these in these ports over here and negotiated with tribes that had conflicts with other tribes. So other times Europeans would just um, raid a community. So you know even though you know it was easier maybe to get it from 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 these African rulers, other times they just go in there and, and just raid and capture people. So again that. Did African people enslave their own people? And, and then I go back to this question because it's an important question. And again, that is too simplistic. Instead, historians have analyzed how European movement into deeper parts of Africa caused tribes to fight to maintain their kingdom's historical control and rules over slave trading. It's like a snowball effect. Right, they're trying to maintain a system of slavery that they have familiar with, where you know you can obtain your freedom and so forth. 
But as they go deeper, as the Europeans go deeper, it's harder to maintain. There are examples where the Europeans could not easily exploit these systems. And again, this is a period where these power dynamics are shifting. So there's an example when the English traders got wind of a conflict between the Abrer, A-B-R-A-E-R, and the Coromanti community near Anomabo, which is by the Ghana coast. So they try to exploit this conflict that these two tribes had. So the British assumed that they could obtain the losing group from the victors. What happened was that these two communities were members of the Fonti speaking polities that were based on by the tradition of matrilineal based kingship rather than territorial boundaries such as in Europe. This kingship prohibited the selling of one another into the slave trade. So there we see an example with the slave trade, um, the, 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 the slave trade system the Europeans brought in was not fully engulfed in these places where uh, this, you know, these two tribes who were fighting each other were able to kind of keep the, the Europeans at bay, saying we're not going to enslave uh, these other people because we're of the same community. Obviously, that doesn't hold um, uh, for, for very long because eventually, you know, it's just too lucrative to, to, to not trade. <clears throat> Sorry. So then we must talk about the, the Middle Passage. So the slave trade was basically the construction of a commodity like potatoes, like gold, like silver, right? These were not human beings, but this was a commodity that you could pack on a boat and you could profit from it. So traders packed the boats over, often over capacity with about 20% of these uh, slaves dying before they reach their destination. So I want you to see again how this system is being developed. It's commerce, it's exploitation, and you will develop, at least Europeans will institute a system of chattel slavery. So I'm going to stop it here because I want to show you a video about this middle passage. It's a short video. And then I'm going to continue the conversation by showing you how race formation and chattel slavery um, begin to dominate.